looking at the uh, music of, of Pepper Adams, and we have uh, the uh, biographer of Pepper Adams, uh, Gary Carner, on the line right now uh, to talk about Reflectory, the biography of Pepper Adams, which I read uh, as an e an e-book for the first time reading one of those and uh, gary welcome to wpfw it was, it was just thank you just thank a marvelous so read just i'm um, just just in awe of, of the details that that you're able to to elude and elucidate yeah, you know what uh, but go, go back to well, WPFW. i appreciate that <laughs> i appreciate you reading it yes absolutely <laughs> no it was, it was marvelous uh reading it on my my uh, iphone that's <laughs> for for first, I, wow. read, I read lots of articles, but the first time dealing with a book. In any case, yeah. uh, let, let's start from the beginning and, and how you became a, a acquainted with Pepper Adams and, and how it's been a, been a lifelong uh, a love of his music and, and of him that have led you to to the book. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks again for having me. I haven't seen you. Well, I'm not seeing you now because we're on the phone, but I haven't spoken with you or, or technically seen you since 2012. When I did my first book on Pepper Adams, which was the discography, right? But yeah, I met him in uh, nineteen summer of nineteen eighty four. I was in the middle of a two year master's program in English at CCNY City College in New York, and I had uh, gotten approval when I started the program the year before that of doing a, an oral history of a jazz musician as my thesis. And Pepper Adams was the only person who responded to my letters. I sent out oh. letters then. Mm-hmm. This is per- this is pre-internet. This is 1984. Right. Oh, sure. And he uh, had some time on his hands because he um, was in- incapacitated with a broken leg. And he actually managed to run himself over with his own car, which is another story oh, right. entirely. It was in the book. And, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you read about that, right? Oh. Yeah, so, so basically uh, I met him in the summer of 1984. He said, well, come on over once my orthopedist says I can, can see you. And um, so I went over there. It turns out that I was sort of like six degrees of separation because um, Thad Jones's son Bruce was in my seventh grade class. Uh huh. Okay. So when he fa- so I was like I was family, you know. Mm-hmm. And we hit it off. And and one thing led to another. We ended up doing about eighteen, nineteen hours of interview that that summer. And then he went on tour. And he came back from Europe uh, with lung cancer the following year. So I only knew him for. The last two years of his life, but it was just a, an incredible time to, to 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 get to know him in depth, like he did. Well, yeah, I I considered him a friend. He would send me postcards from his trips uh, abroad. Um, I would go to his house and watch football games with him. Um, you know, we'd go out to eat. I'd see him play. But but then when I left to go for a master's in music. In Boston, I we, we sort of lost time. I stayed in touch, but I wasn't able to hear him play because um, I left town. But um, what a, just an absolutely extraordinary person. I mean, how do you do something for, for 37 years and, and be enthusiastic about it? You, <laughs> you, you pick somebody who you gravely admire who's, mm-hmm. who exceeds your original admiration. I mean, the more I delve, the more I learn... Uh, <laughs> The more I admired his, his music and who he was as a person, he was so universally admired as a person, not just as a musician. I mean, really, yeah, selfless and uh, just a beautiful person. Treated people with a lot of respect. A lot. Uh, I was uh, the drummer Tony Inzalaku who told me it was really amazing how somebody of his talent who wasn't appreciated the way he should be was so humble and so actualized. Um, and so that's basically the way everybody. Mel, Mel, Max Roach told me he was one of the most liked people in the industry, and that's the way everybody felt. Absolutely, and 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 you you interviewed uh, numerous musicians who are, who are no longer with us, people who are part of his scene. Now, tell us why why he he was so important as a musician, particularly on 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 his instrument. Well, essentially, when he decided to 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 adopt the baritone saxophone in the 1947-1948, there were very few musicians that were playing it as a solo instrument. A lot of people had trouble keeping up with the beat. There was huffing and puffing and falling behind. Um, he just never felt that he was going to have any trouble with the instrument. So there really weren't that many practitioners. He said it was a wide-open field. And because of the fact that his first love was classical music, he had a very sophisticated harmonic 
sensibility, which he applied to the to his improvisations. Uh, but but he was a brilliant man, so he had an encyclopedic mind, and he was able to incorporate all sorts of uh, amazing quotations in his playing. And um, he just basically lifted the instrument to the level of all other instruments. I consider him to be akin to what J.J. J. Johnson did with the trombone and what Jimmy Blanton did to the bass. He lifted it up mm-hmm. to the level of a, So in other words, Pepper Adams was, ta- was playing Art Tatum lines on a baritone saxophone. So many people would tell me he played it like an alto. He just wasn't, the, the, you know, he, and he also had a tremendously large sound. All the overtones were, I mean, not a lot of volume. He wasn't a huge guy. But he he had all those overtones in the sound, as Gary Smolian pointed out. So he had a really big, beautiful sound, which he developed because he wanted to develop what he called a firm, penetrating sound without the use of a microphone. Uh, that was back in the 40s. And so he adapted the uh, mouthpiece of Wardell Gray. Uh, it was a Burke Larson mouthpiece, and he got that really great sound. But um, just uh, his vocabulary, his, his use of his uh, un- unusual approach to the blues um, as a composer. You just played Ephemera, which was his favorite composition of the 42 that he wrote. A uh, very fine composer, but just a brilliant virtuoso. Now, when he, so was, st- say- he, yeah, when he was starting, like Harry Carney was the one who had the, 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 the instrument established with all the years with Ellington. Right. And, and there were some others coming up, I, I guess, uh, uh, who were some of the other folks that, that were playing the baritone around the time he's coming up in the 40s? Uh, well, he would have heard Leo Parker, D.C.'s Leo Parker. Sure. I, I, mm-hmm. and when he was just playing the instrument, Leo Parker spent a lot of time in Detroit, maybe about a year or so. He'd come, he passed through a lot with when he had a band with Fast Navarro. Pepper heard him there. He he heard uh, Sir Shaloff live sure, in Detroit okay. a few years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cecil Payne was beginning. Uh, right. Cecil Payne more more of a contemporary, but he was starting to get well, uh, reasonably well known. Harry Carney was really the model, and sure. Pepper really admired Harry mm-hmm. Carney for the way he got around the instrument, the, the the amount of air that he put in the horn, his sound. But Harry Carney was not an improviser, right. a pure improviser. He would, as Pepper said, he would. He would develop a solo for it to fit into Ellington or Strayhorn's arrangements, and he he tended to repeat them himself. He would basically write an improvisation and play that every time he did a tune. Pepper was a true improviser. Pepper said you would never hear Car- Harry Carney at a jam session playing right, twenty right, courses in Perdido. Right. That just wasn't his thing. Pepper was a true improviser. He's extraordinary, and a lot of people don't know that. Pepper Adams was Harry Carney's designated sub in the Ellington band. Wow, wow. But Harry Carney, the Iron Man, only missed two weeks and 50 years. Right. And it wasn't, it wasn't convenient for Pepper to make those two weeks. No, no. Harry was also uh, Duke's driver, so he had another essential job. To That's right. Uh, That's correct. Uh, you, you do a, a comparison of him with, with Jerry Mulligan. Uh, t- tell us about that. The, the, the well, yeah, Jerry Mulligan was the other person who was, who was on the scene, and they had a, a dramatically different style. Even though they were both Irish and they both played the same instrument, and they're pretty much the same age, uh, Jerry Mulligan became the darling of the jazz press, became extremely popular. Uh, essentially, he didn't play the bottom of the baritone. He, he, he mostly played the middle and upper register, and he played with a very light sound. He didn't play with a lot of wind. It's not a style that Pepper Adams was uh, was drawn to at all, and uh, so they, in a sense, became rivals. Although they Pepper really didn't um, didn't see it that way. Although he was a little embittered by the fact that um, it seemed like the public could, co- could only embrace one person on the instrument. Finally, Pepper Adams passed him in Down Beast Readers Bowl in the late seventies, and Pepper won all the polls from that point on. Because at that time he went out on his own and left the Fat Jones Melodist Orchestra and was finally touring the world as a single. Um, but yeah, Mulligan was very, very well known. He sold a lot of records and, but they had such a, you know, it's basically comparing Lester Young to John Coltrane or, or Lester Young to Bird. I mean, just a very different style. Sure. You know? Okay. Okay. Now he, he, he grew up in Rochester, which, which established his musical training in many ways. But what, yeah. what drew him to, to, uh, did you, to Detroit, and how did he fall oh, into all these great? Oh, right, he was born there, and then moved 
to Rochester with his family. Well, this is this is what happened. His uh, because of the uh, the crash, the uh, stock market crash. His father lost all his savings. Lost they lost their house, and the parents had a split because the the uh, their uh, uh, the, his his grand Pepper's grandparents couldn't put them all, all three of them up. It was uh, he was a, a, a single child. Uh, uh, the only, an only child, I should say. So in any case, so what happened is uh, Pepper, at the age of like one, went with his mother and stayed outside of Fort Wayne in Columbia City, Indiana. And his father went back to where his family was in Rochester, because that's where it's his, uh, Rome, basically Rome, Rochester, up in upstate New York. So so his father was looking for work whenever he could find it, and the Pepper lived on a, on a family's farm, his, um, the Coyle family farm, his mother's farm. And then they, they uh, coalesced, they got back together in 1934. Rochester, a lot, of people, a lot of people don't know, Rochester was basically what the Silicon Valley is now. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. BC, it was very, very affluent, very industrialized. Um, so uh, it was very vibrant. It was one of the few, it was, you know, they were on there. They, they were, it wasn't easy, but, um, but still it was one of the most vibrant cities during the Depression. They still had a tax base with Bausch and Lilman Kodak. They still uh, had mu- musical instruments in the in this in the school system, and that's that's one of the reasons why Pepper got drawn to the clarinet ultimately in the school. But that, but that's why Pepper went to Rochester because his dad was there. Then his dad passed away when he was nine. His mother decided that as a school teacher, the pay was much better in Detroit, and she had fin- uh, friends there. So she decided to move Pepper back, and that turned out to be the most significant thing in, in Pepper's life, really, because he, within a few days, was with Tommy Flanagan and Kenny Burrell and Barry Harris and that, that whole clique of guys. Yeah, absolutely. And gals. And that that basically shaped him. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no question about that. So Pepper was there from 1947 until 56 with a, with a two-year stint in the Army. Um, and uh, he's, he's uh, I consider him a Detroiter. Detroit's really the theme of the book. Absolutely. But I do try, I do try to talk about Rochester a little bit, mm-hmm. but I'm just so excited to be able to talk to anybody about this book because it is an e-book and it's basically <laughs> word of mouth, you know. So Sure. No, thanks, it's, it was just so remarkable uh, in terms of, uh, is, there, is there any aspect of getting getting it published as, as a hard? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. actually, uh, I've, I've been offered... Um, the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm waiting for a contract to, pr- to put it out in paperback. Now, the, the, uh, the, the disadvantage of putting it out in paperback is because Pepper is not a household name. Sure. Typically, only academic presses will take it, and because of economics, they want a book that's about 250 pages, no more than 300 pages with an index, to keep it affordable on the shelf. So. Mm-hmm. You know that book's pretty long. I had actually cut it down by uh, by almost two thirds, but fortunately the photographs were a lot of that. And but I had to take all the music links out. The ebook allows you to see all these photographs sure. and listen to all this music that I talk about, which nobody's ever heard. There's like something like 250 tunes in there that have never been released before. It's really extraordinary stuff. But yeah, um, you can expect uh, it won't be called Reflectory to Life and Music of Pepper Adams. It'll have to be rebranded some other way. And I don't have a contract yet, so I can't talk about the press quite yet, but it looks okay. like it'll be out um, okay. in academic libraries for the first six months and then in paperback sometime in the spring. But it'll be the biography of Pepper Adams for sure. Fantastic. You know? No, no. Yeah. Just, but the, the e-book was excellent. I, I mean, and it's like... Uh, a whole new thing for me in terms of I'm, I'm reading articles, of course, you know, uh, the New yeah. Yorker or whatever. I've been been doing that for 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 ages, but uh, it was quite an experience, you know, having those links available and everything. How can how can listeners get a hold of the ebook? Well, you can just go to pepperadams.com and right at right at the homepage there, there's pictures of my two books. The first one is, is Pepper Adams' is Joy Road, which is an annotated discography, but this is called Reflector. If you just click through. Then it'll tell you where to buy the book. It says buy the book here. There's a big link and some other information. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's twenty four ninety nine. You can also get it on Amazon. Um, it's it's available on uh, all sorts of uh, online booksellers. But again, the reason for the ebook is because I wanted the music to not end up totally unheard. Sure. I wanted photographs to be heard. I also wanted to write a little more length than I knew that I'd be able to do with, with an academic press. 
And when you do something for 37 years, um, <laughs> you, you should have something to say, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I'm just amazed, you know, like, like the details that you have about, about his service in Korea. You know. Yeah, wasn't that incredible? You know, yeah, how I did mean, you, how do you, uh, how do you get that information, you know, in terms of? Well, yeah, I mean, it was just compulsive interviewing, Rusty. Okay, I sure, mean, uh-huh. Pepper, Pepper was, I'm not going to say reclusive in any way, that's not, but he was a modest man. He didn't want, as I mentioned in the, uh, the, the, the prologue, he got, and this is true of a lot of servicemen. They don't like talking about their military sure. experience because they see horrible things. And Pepper did see some horrible things, but, I had the very good fortune of interviewing Doc Holliday, a baritone player who was in the service with him, and also um, Ron Colber, the Barry player, from, uh, formerly uh, an alto player who became a Barry player from, from Chicago, who was in the service with him. And then Norb, Norb Gray, this other guy who was in the service with him. And that's what I was basing all my information on until suddenly I found this lady who, who's, who's, uh, Je- who's Father Jerry Lemire was in the service, and then she led me to this book that this person, who was in Pepper's Platoon, wrote. And I ended up interviewing this guy. And this happened really late, only a few years ago. And he talked. He gave me the nitty gritty of everything they were doing in the platoon. So between all of that, I was able to piece it together. But that's the way this book was. Um, Pepper didn't talk about us, even though I interviewed him for eighteen, nineteen hours. He didn't talk about his personal relationships. And, um, and you, you I did had a piece. You did get a lot of information about, about his relationships with women, you know, and how he's, in many ways, a shy guy. But, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it, but it was just uh, fascinating how you were able to, to, to pull together the details on that. And, and again, back to what you, you were mentioning earlier about the relationship with the musicians from, from Detroit. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was obviously really, really critical in, in terms of uh, the, the, the friendships that, that he had. Uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, sure. Uh, I mean, essentially, there was, uh, he went from a, a city, Rochester, that had a very, very small African-American uh, scene, and particularly a jazz scene, although there's a pretty good jazz scene in Rochester, to, a, uh, to the fourth largest city in America at the time. So they had a very established entertainment industry back all the way back to the twenties with uh, McKinney's, McKinney's Cotton Pickers, Don Redman, and all sorts of great bands. So, so Pepper um, just started meeting all these musicians his age, and uh, also went to Wayne University, which became Wayne State a few years later. So he met musicians there, and it just that was a very vibrant scene. Uh, I don't want to spoil what I say about Detroit, but Detroit had a very nurturing educational pro, uh, system there uh, for passing on the tradition from generation to generation. And, um, well, I, can, I guess I can spoil the secret a little bit. He, it just wasn't cutthroat. It wasn't machismo. It was more of a, a female-centered model where people were very supportive, and it was like a little university unto itself where people were always jamming and, and transcribing music and doing uh, gigs. Plus, the scene in Detroit at that time was really vibrant. It was uh, arguably the best scene in the country at that time, and it was certainly rivaled New York based upon what everybody told me, which is to say that there was just a lot of clubs, a lot of neighborhood joints where people could really do their thing and play with their elders, and it was a very supportive environment, but it was a very high-level musicianship. I mean, when you look at the people that were there, the generation before Pepper, it was uh, uh, Howard McGee, uh, Dizzy Gillespie was through there all the time, um, Al McKibben, all these wonderful players from the 30s and 40s, uh, Lucky Thompson, uh, Milt Jackson, uh, Hank Jones. And so all these great musicians were being, tu- all these great musicians of Peppers era were being tutored by these wonderful players that were Wardell Gray. I mean, it was really astounding. So Pepper had the opportunity to play and be tutored by these great musicians. And then when you look at the people he was around, Elvin Jones and Tommy Flanagan and uh, Kenny Burrell, whose birthday is coming up in the next few days, uh, I guess he's 91 or 92, 92. still. 92, mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I actually gave a, I, I gave a lecture on Pepper Adams in this class at UCLA uh, uh, quite a few years ago. But yeah, it was oh, just an boy. extraordinary, extra. Barry Harris had his salon there where he was teaching everybody. Frank Foster and, and Joe Henderson came through, uh, moved to Detroit. I mean, it was just a 
astounding. Um, and then there, I talk about also the role of, um, of Grinnell as a piano manufacturer, the fact that the, one of the reasons why Motown came to be uh, was because all these great jazz musicians were brought into Motown to support all these great singers like the Supremes and Stevie Wonder, um, uh, principally because of the culture of the of this school system and a really, really fantastic public school education and also the the ability for everybody to have a piano in their house because there were very few high-rise apartments. The city's geography, as you probably read, was mostly single, small single-family homes. So that supported the, the ability for people to get pianos. And so there's a high level of musicianship in the city because of that. So it's just an incredible culture, and it was it's just exciting to figure this all out. But more than that, it was just exciting to learn about Pepper and to hear how much he was adored by all his all his colleagues, and, and to place him in, in Rochester and to place him in the Eastman School of Music where he was going and jamming as a kid, and to place him in that scene in Detroit, and to place him among what was going on in the fifties in New York with the abstract expressionist painters and all the jam sessions and lofts. It was just. He was involved in a lot of stuff. He was, a, was, re- he was cool. a real intellectual, a real hip intellectual. I, I see uh, you, you mentioning his, his reading Joyce and uh, the, the the poem that 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 you included with references to uh, World War One battles, and, and and it was just incredible the range of uh, intellect that yeah. he had. That that uh, connection with the Detroit musician certainly stayed with his his move to New York. Uh, Absolutely, uh, uh, working and yeah. hanging out with Elvin Jones, and uh, then uh, working with and rooming Th- with him, uh, and and then the working with Thad Jones with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, right? And the years with Donald Byrd uh, on the recordings that he did with with uh, Donald Byrd, it was just just an, an incredible con- connection that he had there. Yeah, his his connection with all of the I mean Detroiters were uh, that's where the, his affinity with with was strongest with those musicians that he. He uh, befriended and played with. I mean, those guys were really tight. And uh, I go into detail about how that came to be. I mean, there are four, basically uh, uh, four principal venues to where Pepper was always playing. And uh, those, they, it's just they, they would hang out. Curtis Fuller was in that scene. I mean, it was just Roland Hanna. It was fantastic. Really, really fantastic. Yeah, he was something else, man. And I hope your listeners enjoy the music that you play of his. And I hope that they understand that not all musicians, um, not all musicians are known because a lot of musicians function as sidemen. Sure. And there's a tremendous bias against sidemen. There's a bias toward band leaders, and that gets back to Mulligan. Mulligan was a band leader, became popular, and he had the funding. Whereas Tapper was a side man because he didn't have a, the funding and he played the baritone like a baritone, whereas you can make a case that Mulligan played it like a tenor. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, again, uh, uh, Gary, tell us how, how folks can can get a hold of Reflectory. Yeah, uh, the the book Reflectory is available at Lulu dot com, but you can just go through PepperAdams dot com. The site that I keep is the historical record of Pepper Adams. So pepperadams.com, just the way you expect it to be spelled. And then you'll see a picture of the cover of the book, and you can just click through that. And then once you click through that, you'll see the link to the book, and uh, you can pick it up that way. It's now known, it's available as an ebook only now, but the beautiful thing about an ebook is that if you're reading it on your tablet or your laptop or your phone, as you do, Rusty, you can enable all these music links and hear all the music that I'm discussing and also see all these photographs. So there's a tremendous wealth of information in there. Well, Gary, I, I really appreciated the conversation tonight, and uh, uh, we're going to continue musically with another LP that I, I, I pulled up, uh, Reflectory, okay. Reflectory, <laughs> with, with yeah. Roland, Roland Hanna, George Raz and, and my, my, my good longtime friend Billy Hart on, on drums. And, yeah, uh, okay. and just so you know, Pepper considered that his favorite album, so you picked a real good one. <laughs> well, it was, it was great talking with you folks. You, you've been listening to, uh, Gary Carner, the, the author of Reflectory and, uh, 
Uh, you, they tuned to WPFW 89.3 in Washington, 3 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 in Washington.